was always brought up to believe that being a Letha was a thing to be proud of. That all my uh, forebears before me had been Lethas. My mother and father were both born in Leith, as were their parents and grandparents before them. So it had been a considerable amount of generations before me who had been Lethas. It, it's like almost being uh, a, a United Kingdom person, but being deeply proud of your Scots heritage and deeply proud of being Scots and not wanting to be suppressed by England. And I think it's like that very much for Lethers, who, who see themselves as, as being Lethers and very proud of being Lethers. And perhaps because of the fact that Big, Ed, Big Edinburgh, the big brother up the top there, has always been looking down at them and suppressing to a certain extent their existence and their, their own individuality. Because the story of Leith is not all that different from the story of most other shipbuilding areas all around the country, perhaps even all around the industrial world. But where Leith perhaps differs slightly is Leith has always been at the sharp edge of the stick from Edinburgh constantly poking it. Edinburgh tried to dominate Leith for centuries, using its royal privileges to regulate the trade of the port. But despite this, the town held on to its own identity as an industrial working community. Leith had been Scotland's premier port. Scotland's old alliance grew up through the trade of clarets between Leith and Bordeaux. From here, ships traded with the Baltic and North European ports. Edinburgh finally took over the administration of the port in 1920, when the independent borough of Leith was forced to amalgamate with the city. But Leithers didn't like it. A plebiscite of Leith voters voted massively against the merger. But despite this result, amalgamation did go ahead. The generation that was uh, adult at the time of amalgamation never changed its mind. They considered amalgamation was a complete disaster. It meant the end of Leith as a freestanding, independent place. And the feeling was, with these people, that given a bit more time and a bit more in the way of financial resources, things could have been made to work. Leith, in a sense, existed because it wanted to get away from Big Brother. Unfortunately, it's now forced back into the situation since 1920, where Big Brother dominates. And yet the Leith image, the Leith personality and characteristics still prevail. Of course, if you look at its history, it is um, a mixture of many things. It had uh, tremendous shipbuilding yards. It was a tremendous port, exporting not just to uh, Europe, but worldwide. It had um, all the subsidiary industries ancillary to what uh, a great port would wish. And of course it had whiskey, it still has whiskey, but uh, whiskey is in decline as well. It had 101 things. What's different about me? I don't think there's a great deal different nowadays from anywhere else, but... I think it's a closer community. Like, you can come into Leith and you'll always meet somebody that you know, you'll always speak to somebody. Leith people speak to you sort of thing, you know. I don't know what makes people different. You know how, well, how Glasgow thinks they're better than Edinburgh? Well, Leith are things are better than Edinburgh as well. I think it's just because people have lived here. You know, there's that, sort of, there's generations of people that have always lived in Leith and they've grown up and their children have grown up. Yeah. A lot of families and they've always been in Leith. We could even be at house then. And I mean, we've lost a lot of factories. I mean, we've lost all the bonds. And I mean, there used to be like sweetie factories, biscuit factories, and they're all gone. I mean, they've, they've destroyed that, the industry. Well, it was like most seaports, the industry was more or less in or about the river itself. I started work in 1936, but at that time there was heavy industry, there was shipbuilding, ship repairing yards, there was huge coopering places for the herring. We know that times change, I still think that some of the old skills are, are needed. Thank you. 
They don't commission cranes at that time. In the 30s, I'm talking about, were mostly hydraulic cranes, and they were static. They didn't jib up and down. They, they could go around, back and forward like that, and everything had to be sort of brought to the centre point, as it were. And they, they, most of them used their own winchmen. That was the, the winches on the on the ship. It'd be six men in the hold, the hatchman, two winchmen, what you call a lander. And he landed the cargo along with the barrowmen, and there were maybe three or four barrowmen. And then there were six stores. The men pulled the barrow up, maybe one man shoving, and uh, there was roughly about 70 men a squad. That was hand, hand barrows, pretty heavy too. Well, it was all right if you had a book registered, you see? And if you were registered as a docker, you got a black book. And you, well, you couldn't get a job as they. For the likes of me, I had not a black book. I had to wait till all the registered dockers were employed. And then we got what work that was left. They cried us fags. But the thing is, we got all the dirty work. The dockers wouldn't go to slates, they wouldn't go to bricks. A lot of them wouldn't go to cement. They wouldn't go to dirty barley or dirty knees. Again, they wouldn't go to any dirty job. The dockers were in a leak like the factory jobs. The ship there just was a matter of five minutes walk or seven minutes walk from where I lived. It was down the corner across the road and I, you were in the docks. Rambies and Ferguson was right there, and later on Henry Rome's come. And across the other end of the dock was Minis's. All these yards were just scattered round about. But Rambies was the main one, where they built the boats and that. In the shipbuilding in May days, every man had his pride. When you seen it, the old fashioned boat, you could see it yourself, well, I did not. I, I, I did not, and it's great. You followed your father's footsteps. The family was in, you were in, and they told you when there was a job coming up, and you went to there, and then you gradually put yourself up. First as a catch boy, or a marking boy, you become, become a plater, or a holder on, and riveter. I was a catch boy. I caught the rabbits, went for the rabbits. My father was a holder on. He went inside the tank, double bottom tanks, and I went with him, catching the rabbits to put in a hole. By 1918, there were five different yards working in the docks. At this time, a new yard was established by Henry Robb, which started by concentrating on ship repair work and expanded to become the main yard. Rob only built the outside shell, which was beautiful ships. Beautiful ships. He was a good man, Henry Rob. He gave you work, but he wanted to spoil your flesh. <coughs> he was a great businessman, which mm. proved it with the work he got in the hard times in the 1920s, 30s. Right. If it hadn't been for him, I don't think there'd have been any shipyards in Lake. <laughs> True, I agree with that. He yes. kept them going when they were all closed down. It, it was just like a, a huge shop you were in, and everything was thump a 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 thump Everything was going, going, going. And when you went into a ship, the, vi the whole of the ship vibrated with the noise. The atmosphere vibrated with the noise. The, the sun maybe coming t through some of the portholes, and you can see the, the dust in the atmosphere vibrating, the noise bump, 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 bump all, day, all day long, all day long, one week, one month after another, until actually the ship was finished.
nobody was with him for ever, nobody was getting the cheer with the money. But uh, when the doctor was in the bed, I think it was the pawnbroker who was getting a cheer with the money, and he was fond and everything you had. Keep you going. It was a great life in these days, you know. When we talk about the hard lives, everybody was in the same boat as you. I mean, all your neighbours were all the same as you. They all went, they all went to the school the same. You were more like a family and a steer than what you were actually neighbours. I mind in your steer, we had five children with scarlet fever. I was one of them, and there was two with diphtheria. Now, anything like that, and all these children in, these, in this tenement, I mean, if anything happened like that, it spread like wildfire, you know. The whole blooming place was just slums, right? The whole room and kitchens. You're lucky, you thought you were ethy if you got a... Well, we, the house had, we had in Commercial Street had two rooms, <laughs> two bedrooms. So it was, but no bathrooms or anything like that. The Kirgit was the main place. It was alive. It was just alive with people and shops. There was all types of shops and there was the tenements above that. And it was full of characters, you know. They were really you got a good laugh if you went into the Kirgit. And I think everybody at least made for there. Everybody talks about the Kirgit. I mean, when I was a boy you went along on a Saturday night you see the fun, the fights and the place was Chuck a block, can you imagine it? I think Leith's strong identity comes from the fact it was a port, it had a, a different culture from Edinburgh and the fact it was an enforced amalgamation. I would say some people romanticise it or say it's stronger than it is, but I think other people are mistaken if they think it's dead or it's dying. Leith Live, the local oral history group created to record people's memories of the port, has had a great response from the community. One project in which it was involved was a discussion group to put together ideas for a gable end mural. I mean, the houses in there were more or less the same as what was in the Kirgit, where you had the spiral staircase. And you, you branched off into a lobby, and that lobby was pitch black. You had to feel your way along to find the door. And there was rats running about as well. Can you hear again what you're going walking? <laughs> we wanted to avoid the whole sort of romantic, sentimental look at at, you know, old Leith, sunny Leith, because it wasn't a sunny Leith really for most people. And I think what we were trying to get uh, in the, the mural was that it was a hard life. My father was a dock labourer, and I remember very vividly one day him coming back from work, and he stripped off to his moleskin trousers to the waist, and I was really appalled to see the, the red scars on his back, and I asked him, what these scars were, and he said it was a result of carrying 200 weight bags of uh, grain and cement down a gangplank. We wanted this to be a uh, Leaf's mural, something that people in Leaf would, would feel strongly about and would relate to. I think what we've tried to do is record facts and let the interpretation come to the person who's looking at it. So the facts there might instill a sense of pride in a person who's had something to do with the docks. They might look and say, there's a record of what I've done, you know, the part that I've played in Leith. For a, for a young teenager at this time who hasn't got a job, it, it says something completely different. The group that we were working with was quite a diverse group of people, and they all had different views on different things. And we didn't want to make, to take their views and turn them into a very personal statement by ourselves. So the alternative that was left to us really was to weave together all the different aspects of what they were remembering. And also they ranged across different ages. So that we, I think what we've ended up with is almost like a tapestry of, 
of reminiscence, which hopefully, whatever it is, if you can put your finger on what a sense of community is, whatever that is, comes through. jobs as you liked. I mean, there was, they were crying out for workers, you know, they wanted people here, they wanted people there, but people could pick their job what they wanted to do after the war, you know. So we sort of went back away now to what we were away in the 1930s. We were way back now to the 1930s. There's no work for, for the boys or the girls. And a lot. You know, my childhood, so I thought I'd be as well come back to school and try to get some more grades or whatever and try to get on a better course that I liked, enjoyed something I was real interested in. So that's what I'm basically doing now. Well, I've been on the go on and off since I've left school, about two years, I'd say, at least. You're that bored that you, you all you're doing is walking about and leave, or staying in your bed. And you're looking at other, you're walking past shops looking at them and thinking, when am I going to be able to afford to get some of it? It's really pretty depressing. Quite a lot of them actually have taken the crime, you know, I don't think it's mainly to bond them than anything else. And, well, when I gyro, as I said, it doesn't last very long. So you're getting young guys that would normally be a normal guy, turn into crime or drugs, or, you know, it's just getting in a really bad situation at least. Uh, about two years ago, there was a, a big problem with drug dealing and drug taking in this area of Leith, and particularly in the flat, they had a bad reputation. Some of the older teenagers would openly hang about sniffing glue. The heroin thing wasn't so blatantly obvious, you know, but you would hear about things happening and if it was on your, your own landing, you would know that people were going to doors to score heroin and then somebody would be arrested and the flat would be left empty. Now the problem has more or less disappeared. Uh, the police have put a lot of the dealers in jail and I think in general, over the whole country, uh, it's been more difficult for addicts to get hold of heroin on the streets. So it's not nearly such a problem here as it used to be. I think Leith is quite a good area. It's a good area, but it's just a matter of sort of putting up with things and living with things. It's the same all over. I mean, Leith's got the, the bad name than now, but in saying that, it's the same all over, but it's not got as much publicity as Leith has at the present moment. Leith is still is quite a tough place. I mean, it's a port, it's got docks. I mean, an area like that always will have a certain toughness, but it's wrong to kid on that this tough image isn't still part of Leith. But the, the problem are the question is rather, will the tough image be softened? I mean, it is still uh, predominantly a, a working class area with a lot of unemployment, you know, a higher than average unemployment, a serious drugs problem, and far from satisfactory housing. Now Leith has a wide variety of types of housing. In the past, there was a reputation for poor housing because of overcrowding and lack of facilities in the narrow tenement streets around the harbour and the old Kyrgyz. Between the wars, there were various improvement programmes 
to clear the worst slums. Many families were moved to new housing schemes in other parts of the city. By the 1960s, it was no longer acceptable to have families living with outside shared toilets and no hot water. A number of the remaining streets were demolished and replaced by new multi-storey flats. Personally, I don't have any objection to high-rise blocks for single people or couples. They're definitely, in my opinion, the wrong place to house families with children, uh, particularly because if your children are out playing, you're so far away from them, and it takes so long to get to them if there should be an accident or anything like that. Um, also, the isolation in multi-storey blocks. Uh, Neighbours very rarely see each other, unless you make a point of going and introducing yourself when you first move into a multi-storey flat. It's unlikely that anyone would come and introduce themselves to you. I think tenements were more conducive to um, a, a social type of atmosphere and people tended to know each other better in tenement flats. Well, I think, listen, to Lee, well, the youngsters, they didn't hear the hammers gone or they didn't hear anything like that. And they can't go and see a big boat being lunch and shout for air and get their feet wet in the water or something like that. The boys have not got a chance. You know, as a boy where you could hear the hammers going, that everybody around the boot, it was a shipyard worker. And when they were at lunch, it was like a wedding. You thought it would go to period. You went to see the book being lunched. You shouted a raise. Bring on another one, for God's sake. <laughs> Keep their feather working and all this part. But the, the kids have not got that idea now. It's, well, they've got the idea, but they can't see it. It's not there. It's away. Because the labour was severe, they've, all, they've concentrated on getting jobs that don't take many men. They do the same amount of tonnage with tenth of the men. A thousand men in the docks when I come in. Nine hundred to a thousand. It's only hundred and twenty now. There's always been a time in the docks when the dockers had to be at least semi-skilled. There was always, there was always work like winch, winches and ships. But now there's a lot of modern machinery in the docks and these men that can, they have to drive them. And it's a, it's a big responsibility. My dad put my name down when I was 18 uh, to get into the docks. It started in 1963. Uh, it was the National Dock Labour Board that was my employer's head. And, uh, well, I've worked there ever since. Some men like to, what they call, strag. They just go for day to day and take whatever came along. But if you were married, you had to try and get a regular wage. So you folded four men, and you kept with them through thick or thin, really. Good jobs or bad. It was inevitable that the docks had to change. We had to have containerisation. We needed three slum cargoes like pulp. We needed packaged timber and steady handling all that loose stuff, taking two, maybe three days as long to finish a ship. So we had to change with the times. If we hadn't changed with the times, the old joke about the building houses in the docks might very well have happened, because we're a very, we're really a small port, and it could easily have uh, happened like that. An awful lot of ships were lost during the war and it took a f quite a few years for to build up the fleets again and the uh, shipyard was busy for a long time after the war. The first quiet spell, I, I recall, is around about 1960. You always had a sort of quieter spell as your years have been progressing and you're always saying, have we got to get another order, have we got to get another order? But the order always came. 
until eventually we're still saying the same thing two and a half years ago. But the order did come. And that was the closure of the end of rub. Something like 75% of lease employment was concentrated in a relatively small number of medium to large size firms. So there was the danger, which we, we recognise quite clearly, that if anything happened to any one of those firms, the consequences in employment terms could, uh, on the face of it, be quite catastrophic. And one of those was Henry Robb Shipyard. About 80 men are occupying Henry Robb's and refusing to let anyone in to see the 50-foot submarine which remains in its shed behind locked gates. And despite Scottish Secretary George Younger's comment today that the sit-in is a lost cause, the men are in good spirits and deny that they've hijacked the vessel. Well, we, we've had our men laid off here now for six or seven weeks on short-term working, and some of them are in financial difficulty, but we'll be appealing to the men as many as possible not to take the redundancy if they open the redundancies up again, to stay and to fight for their jobs and to keep this yard open. This was a community-based uh, fight, but it wasn't just simply the, the workforce. Um, it was felt that uh, if Robs went, that was the end of any um, industrial base in Leith. Now, that may be exaggerating things, but that was the feeling of uh, Leithers. Um, it was said that uh, Robs is Leith, and um, Leith is Robs. That was the, the slogan that went around at that time. The government were telling us that there was no demand for ships. People were not wanting the ships built. But, I mean, this just wasn't true. I mean, when I came into the shipbuilding, there was 159,000 men employed in the industry. I think at the last count, there was 9,500 employed in it, and that's in a matter of nine years. And they're talking about cutting that with another 3,500. We're going to end up basically in Britain with no shipbuilding industry at all. They're not just putting people out of work, they're actually closing down industries that they can't replace because these men are going elsewhere. They're learning not their own trade, they're learning different jobs. And I mean, you lose your skill. These skills, they'll not come back. As well as the decline in skilled jobs, there has been a great reduction in labouring and factory work in other industries. The whisky bonds are a part of Leith's history. Whisky was first blended in Leith. The bonded warehouses and bottling halls have provided work, particularly for Leith women, for generations. Travis has been here for, oh, ever since I can remember. But the, most of the other places have all shut down. There's not that many now, there's only about three or four places in Leith. There was McKinley's, McDonald Muir, Bell's, Arthur Bell, Crawford's, McDonald Glen Lee's, Low Robertson's. Krabby? Krabby. <coughs> Line light, say, say that one in there. There's only about four or five people on it. I reckon when I first started, there'd maybe be about 15 to 20 women all on the on the table. It was, it was job intensive, you know. Now, I've been working in the bonds for 12 years, and how I came to work in the bonds was my brother was in the, the bonds work, so that was how I got in. And then I left to have my children and I came back 12 years ago to work with Bond then. Well, it was good money. And then Leith was full of Bond, so you just went from one Bond to the other. Now it's, there is only a few left in Leith. But I don't think many would, would be able to concentrate enough that they do the sport we do on the line. Well, it can be quite bittery. And I don't think men have got the nimble fingers for the speed, but I don't think a man could have the patience to do it. Well, the first job that I had in the bond was changing shoots. My mother worked here and my sister worked here as well. So of course when I left the school, I went there. Well, you were looking for work and people recommended you to go to the bond because they were well paid. The bonds were always looking for women all the time. And it was quite easy just to leave and then go back again. But they're closing the mud in and they're just all going out of town. There's only three bonds left in me. I'd like to 
to be in the phones permanent all the time. Money is really good, especially when you first left school. I didn't know what to do with it at first. But the job, the job's never got to be secure. Unless you get brought back about 13 times or more, or try and get a wee bit higher up, but you'll still eventually get paid off. You'll we'll always get paid off. many different industries became interdependent, as with the local printing companies servicing the needs of the whisky industry. Many small firms in Leith depended on the trade of the port and shipyards. I think the reason why there was so many coopers down with is the docks, because a lot of the export used to go right to the docks and the way it went like, but uh, the talk, I would say about 80% of the coopers in Edinburgh uh, either served their time in Leith, because that's where all the cooperages was, in Leith. As I'm saying, I served my time in the DCL at Haymarket, and there was a few round about the outskirts of Edinburgh and that, but Leith was the main sort of cooper shop. You served your time in Leith and that, uh, that was what it was all about. I've seen quite a lot of changes. I've worked with 80 coopers at once in the DCL and now I think there's only about 19. But now it's um, a lot of them took redundancy and a lot of them were all couples left. And it's, to me, I don't think it'll ever get back to what it was years ago. I've been self-employed for about a year now and there is a market for old sort of garden furniture from old barrels. And um, it's tubs. Uh, cleaned over and troughs and small miniature barrels. Uh, anything at all from a, from a barrel. Over the past 20 years, a new community has grown up and become part of the area and is now centred around the many Asian shopkeepers who have settled in Leith. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, always very busy. The customers are friendly, you know. They know us. We know the, we know the customer as well, you know. Because I've been here a long time, people know me very well. I'd like to stay down Leith and all that because I've been working in a lot longer and I like the customers, you know. You do get on with them. Anything else, though? Um, no fancy Philly jeans or something for yourself today? Yeah. For you. <laughs> I really prefer Leith because it's a lot more variety of everything. Show show clubs, pubs and everything. <laughs> so it's I think Leith is the place for me. I've met a lot of customers that I knew really well from my other branch of shop and uh, saying Leith has really gone now but uh, the business isn't here but it's everybody to their own opinion you know I find Leith has been really good everybody makes for what they actually should get really if they work hard they'll get it if they don't work hard they'll not get it we work sometimes like just right through the day we work 24 hours a day we don't mind we actually if we're doing a, a good thing to the business we don't mind We've got seven brothers and we all stick by each other. This is which is good, you know. We help each other out in business. I find it's been really, really, really good to actually know two sides of it, Leith and the Asians, the Sikh side of it. The Sikh side of it is really friendship more and the uh, other side's more business side of it.
when I was young and played in the shore area elite, there was lots and lots of kids around. If you go down to the shore area now, it tends to be young, up-and-coming people who are moving into these houses, and there's no families there, but are few and far between families, so it's an area where people sleep in, and occasionally they're coming out to go to the wine bars. It's not an area like it used to be. Uh, whether I regret that or not, of course I regret it. I regret the fact that there's no industry, there's no noise, there's no hustle and bustle, there's no masses of people moving around, there's no work. But I'm totally aware of the fact that the living conditions for the ordinary people are absolutely atrocious, and that people spent most of their time hoping to hell that they could get out of these living conditions. Even I can remember being brought up as a child in the back of Greens down in Hendon Street. It was rat infested. I've heard one or two people say, saying to me that these talking about the flats that are being renovated in the shore, and I say, oh, I see that flat there's renovated. God, my mother spent all her life praying, trying to get out of that flat, and there's people paying £35,000 to go yeah. back into them. This particular property is probably the best in the building. Uh, you're getting the sun in this window in the morning and the sun in this window in the afternoon. So, all the way um, The cooperage was the first one we were involved in, which was um, an old warehouse which they made barrels in, and it was converted uh, to produce 32 one-bedroom flats. Next was the Maritime House, which, as the name suggests, was an old shipping office, which was converted to 24 one- and two-bedroom flats. And the third development was the King's Landing development, which was really built from scratch and was a mixture of one, two and three bedroom properties. And coming into the bedroom, as you can see, the property again has a very good view over the water. This is one of the big features of this property. Uh, yes. it's a you mentioned the point about security. Yes. Security has been one of the major factors uh, in the design of the building and great emphasis was placed on security. Uh, it's a point that comes up with a number of people. The majority of people who've bought properties in the developments are all from out with the Edinburgh area. And I've been very disappointed at the Edinburgh people's reaction. They still think that lethal or wouldn't want to stay there. I think the local people have been delighted. Um, all these sort of the local leaf people that I know have been delighted with with the changes because everything really is is improving. Um, and the local leaf people, um, with it being a rundown community and with there not being a tremendous amount of money in the area, these would not be the people that would buy properties in the developments. But in general, I think they've been delighted with, with the way things have gone. It was only five short years ago that Leith was suffering from declining economic activity and substantial urban decay. And to help redress those problems, the Leith Project Partnership was set up by the region and the district councils and the agency. Decline in the traditional Leith industries led to dereliction and decay, all the symptoms of urban blight. As companies closed down or moved away, many properties stood empty. Whiskey bonds, factories, warehouses were all left to rot. Unemployment became a way of life in some parts of the town. In 1980, a project coordinated by the Scottish Development Agency was set up with a remit to reverse this decline and to regenerate the economy in the community. When we arrived in Leith, the, the thing that struck me most and my colleagues at that time was the fact that Leith had a lot going for it. It still had uh, a community spirit about the place. It still had, to some extent, a business community. So as a project, we were involved in improving the environment, clearing dereliction, acquiring land for industrial development, building factory units, converting buildings to uh, industrial commercial use, and above all else, encouraging others to do that. That's right, and we're always in partnership and progress in the wine as well. Right? Mm. Uh, you can hear the two glasses. Yeah. I have one of the restaurants I went to, and I'm going to make a number 10. At the same time as the attempts at business development, new initiatives in housing have been taken by community based organisations such as the Port of Leith Housing Association. When an area gets run down like Leith has in the past, um, you tend to find that it's the young and the successful that are the first to move out, leaving behind them the pensioners, 
the old, the infirm, and the poor. And that's, that's not a good balance for a community. So it's not a bad thing that uh, people come in again uh, to, to try and uh, restore the social balance. I still like to think, however, that we, um, in a sense, blazed the trail. Um, we, we showed, before the SDA came in, Portably Housing Association demonstrated that there was a need for good quality housing in Leeds. We've shown that houses can be put up, we've shown that they are desirable, and we've shown that people want to, want to live in them. The difference between us and the private sector uh, is that we're catering for people in housing need. Um, our tenants are selected on the basis that they really could not obtain accommodation uh, from any other agency other than ourselves or possibly the district council. I would say that the main reason that the private developers, not only of housing but of, 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 of warehouses and sites and small factory units, the main reason they've come in is, has been because of the success of the Scottish Development Agency. They've solely, they've sold it hard. Um, they've they've uh, restored, they've stone cleaned, they've planted trees, they've made the environment more attractive. Well, today, um, we can look around and we can say things are marvellous. We see these wonderful uh, cleaned up buildings and it's uh, a kind of cosmetic exercise uh, uh, organised largely by the SDA and full marks them. Sure, you know, it looks wonderful. You can go into all sorts of trendy restaurants and pubs. Fine if you've got money. But if you're unemployed, it's quite different. And unfortunately, you've got many individuals who have no job whatsoever. You've got kids leaving school, no job, no hope, no future. And that's the reality of Leith. I think it's, I think it's just a facade. They've, I mean, all the new projects around the shore making the housing, you know, building new houses out of derelict blocks for people with a lot of money to move into, where it'd be nice to look out onto the, the water of Leith. Whereas there are people already living here in housing conditions that are very, very poor. I mean, I reckon they'd be better tackling the housing problem from the point of view of people actually living in them, as opposed to making them up into sort of 30,000 pound flats and then selling them to rich people who can come and say, oh, how nice Leith is. We couldn't attract the major multinationals to Leith because we didn't have the advantages which would do that. But Leith, as I said, did have other things going for it. Small firms in the service sector, uh, servicing the Edinburgh market, very, very high representation, if you like, of printing firms doing typesetting, colour separation, things like that in Leith. Our small workshop units have been very, very successful. So an element of the strategy that we, we indulged in was directed towards small firm development uh, in the hope that over the period of the project and in the longer term above all else that the employment base of Leith could be spread across a larger number of firms so Leith you know as a, an economic entity if you like would not be so vulnerable to one single major closure. There is definitely there is a new Leith I mean I think quite a bit of it can be hyped up it, or it has been I mean, because there are various reasons. I mean, people had to hype it up to give a bit of confidence in the area, like with the SDA and the District Council, Lothian Region, etc. And you know how people speak about or joke about Leith Sewer Mayor or, you know, a new Amsterdam sort of thing. There is a, two aspects to the trendy Leith. I mean, there's the, the sort of richer trendy Leith there that is the wine bar scene, but then there's this other sort of uh, culture growing up. They're building up in the area, you get artists, carpenters, and a lot of these new people are, is this new sort of person coming into Leith. When the shipyard closed, we never had, could put our hand to any other trade, for the simple fact that uh, if you were a painter or a joiner, you could always put your hand to going to the housing schemes of painting here and painting it. But I've looked a hard way and it's just, I can't find anybody who wants to buy a, a battleship. And that's just about the, the sad part of it. We're left holding a battleship round our neck and nobody wants it. All well, the knowledge and all the feelings that we've got for shipbuilding is of no use to anybody now. Dead. 
outside. We folks are famous all over the world. Yeah? Everybody here. You see, Scotland, and it's like we folks, Aberdeen, Port Glasgow. And like, it was like Eden, was it Scotland's biggest port? We was Scotland's biggest yeah. port. <laughs> now there's nothing there. There isn't the big industrial employment here like there used to be. So the kind of community spirit that's going to develop will be different from the community spirit that there used to be, which was based on the employment in the area. There were all Dockers families that lived here. Now, if people are working at all, then they're not working at the same place. They don't have the same lifestyle in common. Everyone here is very different. So if a community spirit is to develop here again, then it's the only thing we're going to have in common is the area where we stay. So it seems to be there's a picture of the future relief which has basically lost its, its, its original rural in industries that it used to have, its industries such as its shipbuilding and its whiskies and its sailors. It, it's, it's very, very quickly disappearing. What it's going to be replaced with, I don't know. What we're going to do is we're going to make a film about the future of Leeds and how you think Leeds might be in the future. And we're going to have a person who comes to Leeds Thank you. 